Good, on. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me give you a quote to start with. And before I give you the quote, let me apologize that it talks about young men and not about young women, but that's the person who, who, who produced this quote. When a multitude of young men come together and freely mix with each other, they are sure to learn from one another, even if there be no one to teach them. The conversation of all is a series of lectures to each, and they gain for themselves new ideas and views, fresh matter of thought, and distinct principles for judging and acting. That's from John Henry Newman in his essay, The Idea of University. And he believed that discourse and debate with one's peers were a considerably stronger foundation for a university than a teacher-full campus giving its degrees just to anyone who happened to pass its examinations. Now, Newman, of course, became the rector of the Catholic University of Ireland in 1854, which in turn evolved into University College Dublin. And one must wonder what his reactions would be today to the operation of our current educational system with its propensity to learning by rote, deep immersion in narrow topics, and intensely competitive solo performances. Now, group work, assistance to, one peer, to one's peers, and team performance are explicitly encouraged throughout the Irish educational system in just one location, the sports field. In almost every other situation, rather than group discourse and team building, individual attainment is instead specifically nurtured, measured, and rewarded. Group relations, the emergence and cultivation of leadership, the importance of mentoring and coaching, are all usually set aside for the treadmill of solo academic achievement. However, group working, leadership, and team behavior are invariably the foundations of any successful human venture and indeed are the critical skills for almost every career after school and university. Why should it be that our education system is so focused on the individual and hardly ever the team? Perhaps one reason is the structure of the educational system itself. In many of our schools, our colleges and universities, most of the staff operate as individuals. Certainly this has been my own experience as a one-time academic, as the chairperson of a major training institution, and now as a school's advisor. The coherence, the optimal performance of the teaching staff are usually the unique concern of the headmaster or the president and seem rarely foremost amongst the quotidian occupations of their employees. How does an educationalist raise the shared performance of the team? It's very striking to observe that on the one hand, if a full-time university academic creates a commercially viable invention, then the employer, the university, claims the rights over the intellectual property concerned. Now, this may be justifiable. After all, the university, and as we've just been reminded again by, by Hugh, and in the Irish system, the state and the taxpayer, pays the full salary of their academic, and hence, in principle, all of their work is owned by the employer. But then, on the other hand, if a full-time lecturer creates a set of speaking notes, tutorials and laboratory exercises for a specific academic course, then the employer almost always does not claim any ownership over this intellectual property. In general, teachers tend to jealously guard their own teaching materials. Colleagues are not always aware of precisely what is being taught by their peers. But above all, great course materials are rarely 
freely shared with less experienced teachers of the very same topic, whether they be in the same institution or indeed another elsewhere, even when the state and the taxpayer are paying for all concerned. By contrast, in good enterprise, the best experiences and processes are shared so that the performance of the entire company can be improved. What does it take for teachers nationwide to share best practice with one another and so raise our educational standards? Newman observed that interchange and discourse catalyze learning. If teacher less, students will share their own experiences and learnings directly with each other. Newman said, the essence of teaching is the interchange, the interchange between a group of youths. Mutual education, in the sense of the word, is one of the great and incessant occupations of human society, carried on partly for set purpose and partly not. Can a group of teachers mutually educate themselves? A melting pot of individuals with different experiences, backgrounds, and interests have many things to share. I personally delight in the collision of science and art, that ideas meet and that opinions collide. Discourse leads to discovery. Rationalists translate the familiar, sorry, translate the unfamiliar into familiar concepts. And in contrast, artists take and transpose daily familiarities into unfamiliar parallels. Mathematicians spot patterns so as to understand. Engineers apply patterns so as to create. Leaders naturally emerge to provide direction. Mentors naturally emerge to help others understand. Best practice, learnings from failure, and community commitment are all cultivated. Let me give you a little mind exercise. Imagine a community in which anyone is free to join or leave at any time. Consider that this community has a common objective, a common purpose and goal. Consider that this community has recorded its past experiences, both failures and successes, so that newcomers can quickly understand and appreciate what has happened in the past. Consider that the community has not elected any leader, but that certain individuals' views and actions are generally perceived as having wisdom. Will such a community succeed? Would such a community learn? Would it educate its membership, raise its standards of achievement? In fact, is such a community even a model for raising the standard of teaching in Ireland? My answers to those questions are unequivocally yes. For, as an active member and participant in the internet, I experience and I am a member of such communities every day, and I have been so for at least two decades. Great works have been created and curated on the internet using the social commitment of global communities of strangers having widely different experiences, nationalities and agents, ages in almost all time zones and geographies and with the very best minds and masters. The global internet, paradoxically, is a center. And to quote Newman again, you cannot have the best of every kind everywhere. You must go to some great city or emporium for it. There you will have all the choicest productions of nature and art all together, where you will find, which you find each in its own separate place elsewhere. All the riches of the land and of the earth are carried up thither. There are the best markets, and there the best workmen. It is the center of trade, the supreme court of fashion, the umpire of rival talents, and the standard of things rare and precious. It is the place for seeing galleries of first-rate pictures, and for hearing wonderful voices and performers of transcendent skill. It is the place for great preachers, great orators, great nobles, great statesmen. In the nature of things, 
Greatness and unity go together. Excellence implies a center. The ethos of the internet is sharing. Newman noted, you cannot learn to converse until you have the world to converse with. In the early days of the internet, you could connect your computer for free to the mesh of computers already in the network, but only if you in turn were then prepared to let others, even strangers, connect their computers to yours and so connect to the mesh. Internet browsing and linking documents via clickable hyperlinks, that idea came from a group of physicists who were devising their own way to better share their scientific results and who then shared their new way of working with other disciplines. Social networking and community-based sharing are changing human psychology, enabling us to categorize, to catalog, to track, and participate in much wider and more numerous endeavors than ever before computers emerged to service. Now, a decade ago, in the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, many of us worried about the digital divide. The privileged had access to the internet, and those of limited means did not. Over the last decade, there's been a considerable, greater, affordable access to the internet. Now, I worry about the digital divide of the generations. Most of us know how to book an airline seat online. Most of us know how to send an email. Most of us know how to access our bank account online. But how many of us know how to share our work with online communities? How to upload a YouTube video of our own work or to make a podcast of an interesting discussion? Meanwhile, for the younger generation, the internet is an intrinsic part of the real world, as much as the telephone, as much as the radio, or even the weather. Fergus O'Dowd, Fine Gael education spokesman, tells us that only 2% of our schools have access to broadband. But my observation is that, regardless, almost all of our youth already have access to broadband, and the internet is now absolutely inherent to their lifestyle and to their learning experiences. The internet continues to transform human civilization and social structures. It enables experiences to be shared, the best ideas to be explained and adopted, the best course materials and teaching performances to be viewed online and absorbed. It is not waiting for the Department of Education and Skills, nor the Higher Education Authority, nor our teachers' unions, nor the board of any university or of any school to devise some grand and great strategies. Instead, it is happening around us each and every day. Individual teachers and students around Ireland are already contributing to this groundswell. People such as Thomas McCoughlin, who is building a community around his free internet videos of the entire Junior Certificate Mathematics course in both English and Oscalaga. World-class teaching materials and courses are already freely available via the internet. Will it take very long for versions of these suitable for all the Irish curricula to emerge from such pioneers such as Tomás? This panel session asks whether reform and innovation is needed in Irish education. I assert that such reform and innovation are happening in any case, whether or not our national system chooses to embrace them. Almost all of our young already, and some of our teachers on the ground, are using the internet to share and to learn. For the educational system in Ireland, the digital divide is now between those who have already discovered higher standards of education, learning, understanding, and discourse, and those whose role may soon be relegated to becoming youth sitters, while our youth learn elsewhere. Like some Gaelic Canute down on Port Noor Beach, we can command the internet to stop wetting our toes, or 
we can learn to swim. Thank you.